Welcome back to Autism Live. We're so excited because for the first time here in the studio, we have some folks from the Miller Career and Transition Center. I have been threatening for two years to have Wayne Fogelsong be here, and we finally have made it happen. It's been more on my end than your end, but you're a very busy man. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thrilled to be able to have you here, and I'm excited because you have also brought with you Danielle Donahoe. So I welcome both of you to the show. We want to say that you are the principal of the Miller Career and Transition Center, and you're the vice principal of that same wonderful institution. Mm -hmm. But for our viewers who don't have any idea what the Miller Career and Transition Center is, I love saying that now because I've been saying it backwards all week <laughs> long. Um, what is it? How did it come to be? Well, I would tell you that uh, Miller Career and Transition Center is the first career and transition center in the history of Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, we started uh, about 16 years ago, 16 years ago, converting Miller from what it was then a Miller Miller High School to a Miller Career and Transition Center. And a career and transition center, in in simplest terms, is an occupational center for students with special needs. Our purpose is to prepare our young men and women to go to work someday and to develop the skills necessary that would help them become a contributing member of society as an employee. We use our work programs uh, to develop what we call the soft skills or character skills, those things that employers are looking for, um, staying on task, following directions, working independently, getting along with their fellow employees, advocating for themselves, being able to communicate, being able to dress appropriately. Those are the skills that employers are looking for in our, in our, when we call them interns instead of students. All of them are 18 to 22 years old. So that really is our focus. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that. Well, and and this is an amazing thing, and already I know that people are going, what? This mm -hmm. exists? Because a lot of the times what gets mentioned in the media and what we have folks writing in about is the cliff. Right. That, um, you know, we, we've, we've fought our way through school. I've got a 13 and a half year old. We fight our way through school. I'm throwing things now. I get so excited about it. But uh, we fight our way through school and then suddenly there's a graduation that comes. For some of our kids, it's around the age 18. For some, Correct. it's a little bit older mm -hmm. where suddenly the school service, boom, cliff, mm -hmm. right. where, uh, right. where are we going to go? And it's panic time. Um, a lot of parents are trying to band together and figure out earlier, but to find out that something like this has been in existence for 16 years is going to be news to some people. It's here in Los Angeles. It we is. We're fortunate to have this. And yeah. actually, our, our model that we developed our program after came out of Bakersfield. And actually, I know that the state of New Jersey has several of these mm -hmm. programs. I've never been back to New Jersey when we were first thinking about starting. I thought that the district was going to send me back to New Jersey, but we actually found a place called the Ruggenberg Career Center in Little Bakersfield, and now there's two, Ruggenberg and the Sheets Career Centers, that were kind of modeling what we are doing. But at that time, they were essentially taking students that were 17 and 18 year olds who were on the alternate curriculum that were not going to get a diploma, and they were bringing them to this facility for a half day every day and doing work training with them. So when we were first looking at what a career and transition center was to be or what it could be, that became the model. And at that time I was taking multiple trips up there, taking people from the Division of Special Education, taking people from our own facility, trying to show them what we could be at that time. And I have to be honest, they were very skeptical. Yeah. Not so much the division, but more of our staff, because I don't think they would realize if they look back to where we are today than when we started, they would be shocked. Uh, we have come a tremendous long way since that time period. You want to add to that a little bit? Well, I wasn't there when you started because right. I had to start as an assistant. I'm a lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make that clear. We gotta, we gotta get that clear. She's much so. younger. <laughs> but from the time that you came, she kind of yeah. came in the middle as we were making yeah. these transitions over. So, and yet it has changed a lot because even when I first came and I had the landscaping program, we still were in self-contained classrooms. So we would have our work program and then we would have our central students who would come back to us at that point. And we've moved completely away from that where we don't have self-contained classrooms. Our students are going from room to room. We have a fully developed curriculum now that we follow that focuses on things like career readiness and independent living and social skills. And then we're even making more changes next year That's where right. we're going to move to subject-specific rooms mm -hmm. where the teachers and the students are going to be rotating and, and sort of arranging our rooms so that they are set up for the subjects that we're teaching okay. in each space. Well, now I have a bunch of new questions <laughs> because I have looked at the, the brochure that Correct. you guys have and mm -hmm. I saw all of these different 
potentials that you could do, one right. of them being mm -hmm. landscaping. But yeah. there and we have so 18 work things. programs yes. and we're adding two, two more, more next, next year. year. Well, let's talk about what some of those are because I got excited. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it kind of, it's, it's like you look and you go, oh, well, that sounds interesting and this sounds interesting. What are some of the 18? Well, um, we can start. I mean, I can go from room to room. Uh, I'll take the first half of the facility. You can take okay. the second half okay. of the facility. Um, we have what's called a PAYS lab, a practical assessment exploration. It really is, it's a laboratory that's designed to assess the student's vocational skills. Okay. It was developed by a woman named Dr. Judy Swisher at the University of Kansas almost 35 years ago. Judy um, marketed it, developed this, and then sold it to a company in Florida. I first saw it when I was up in Bakersfield, and I saw it, I was kind of fascinated, but they weren't really operating at what it should be. So I did a little more research when we came back, and we ended up purchasing one for Miller. And um, it's a facility that has 264 hands-on jobs in five basic categories. Every job has a job description card that tells you what to do. Um, they have a check-in sheet for every job that they do. That they, There's a procedure they follow. They clock in. They get a stopwatch because everything they do is timed. And everything they do in there is recorded on essentially ballot sheets it's because the machine is a ballot reader. So they're putting these scores down. They feed it into this machine, and at the end of a semester, because every one of our interns is in there for two hours every day, and at the end you get a 10-page report, a summary of performance that tell you what types of jobs they would be good at, what types of support they would need, what their likes are and dislikes, and uh, what their strengths and potential strengths are. And it really is, a, and it's all data-driven. It's the most data-driven uh, assessment I've ever seen in special education. So that really is a foundational program for what we do. And then from there we go on to culinary arts. We have a culinary arts and food services class where it's a kitchen and they do culinary arts from purchasing food to uh, cooking food to presenting food to serving food to cleaning up your mess. And uh, they use every piece of, and I should say this over, every piece of equipment we use in any of these programs is the same equipment as adults that we would use. Right. So we're not playing games. I, people often ask, are you playing work? No, we're not playing work. It's not a game. We are, we're doing real work and so we use a whole variety of equipment. In fact, can I just interject can that one of the things that I did not know that you that you, you bake things and you sell them. That's that's a little further down. That's <laughs> the the one is cooking food. The other one we have our own bakery. But when if you're practicing cooking food, there ends up being a product. Oh, and there I just is. and I just want to bring up the fact that there is a product and I keep I, I don't plan well. Um, planning is not my strong suit. <laughs> but um, I keep meaning to when I need a birthday cake, I'm told that I can order things you and can. cupcakes mm -hmm. and things like that from the bakery. From the bakery, right. which is product of what you're doing. So it's real work and there is real product it, it, and there is the part of selling it, it that comes later. It yes. is. We also on our front ramp every morning. We detail automobiles by appointment only, so we hand wash, hand wax, inside, outside, we do the whole thing. We've Shut done, up! This is fabulous! We've done okay. cars, trucks, boats, uh, trailers, uh, buses for some of our bus drivers, and we have a mobile crew that goes out, goes out to school and businesses and details also. Two years ago we went out to Camarillo Airport and, Camarillo Airport and detailed our first airplane, and that pilot paid us $185 to detail his airplane. So. That was kind of exciting because no one had done that before. So we sent pictures downtown to the Division of Special Education to my former superintendent said, you got to see this. Um, so we do that. Then we have a class. It's an online business. Uh, it's called E-Trade, We Trade, where they buy and sell on eBay. So it's a business in real time. Uh, the, the teacher in that program gets a lot of stuff donated. He gets records, books, and all kinds of products donated. And what happens in that room is our... Our interns come in each day and they, um, they get the, the products that have been brought in. They go on the computer to check if those items are being sold. If they are being sold, they put a description on the computer. They post it on the internet. They track it on the internet. Once it's sold, they package it up and they take it to the post office and mail it. And you know in that type of environment, it's, it's, it's online and it's in real time. And virtually, if you're any familiar, and most people are familiar with uh, eBay, it's sent all over the world. So our products are literally going all over the world. And he also sets up a reward system in that that's really, really cool. The fact that the, t the interns in there determine at what stage their reward will come. So if, if they sell $250 worth of products, they may be able to go on eBay and buy something for themselves up to $10. If it's $500, it may go up to $20, $750, $25. So there's built-in rewards as you're selling and products go out and everything's in, in a PayPal account, so the money that we make in there, most of it ends up going back to the interns in that program. Love and then we, why don't you talk about theater arts and set design? Theater arts was my baby. I had to fight for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. 
Yeah, um, theater arts and set design is one of the newer programs, and in that class, they do learn, they do full-length plays, they do one a year, and then they also build and design the set, so they do the painting and the construction, and they, you know, we get help from our um, construction class as well as the furniture refinishing class, so they tie together a little bit when they do that. And then um, in previous years, we went on the road, so we would go and perform at elementary schools, at high schools, so that they got that experience of being in front of different audiences, and it just does so much for them their confidence levels, the ability to get out there, and it's kind of like I would tell them, you're on your own when you're out there, it's a big deal, because I can't run out there and save you. So you have to problem solve, you have to be, you know, do well with the team, your teammates out there are relying on you to lead the way, and they, they do a really good job. Amazing. Yeah. And the most important thing that I see from this coming is you get these young men and young women who a lot of times are very shy yes. about getting in front of people and they get up and they end up stand up and they're singing, they're dancing, yeah. they're, and, but they're also building all of the sets, so it's theater arts and set mm -hmm. design. We're not preparing for actors and actresses. I know a lot of those young men on weekends are involved in programs, programs. Um, but it, is, it has been very valuable in that fact that they are being able to advocate, to talk, to be out loud, to speak out loud and so forth, and it's been a very positive thing for them. And then you got graphic arts. With, graphic yeah. arts was another one. <laughs> Originally. Yeah. Um, and in that program currently they do silk screening, they use an embroidery machine, they make greeting cards, they do heat press, um, they have bags, they do the, the shirt orders for the school, all of the embroidery and things like that, your school shirts, they, they do all the ordering and things like for that. They make hats, beanies, they even do socks now that they <laughs> embroider. And the students really run it. Each the, Every team that's in there has a student leader, and the student leader kind of takes charge of each machine. They have a student that did the books last year because he was really good at keeping track of all the finances. So, yeah, and they are constantly busy. So In fact, we did so T-shirts <laughs> we, we for Temple Grand. You know, they yeah. thanks to Joanne Lara, they actually honored us a couple of years ago with a Pathfinder, a Pathfinder Award. And we ended up making 350 shirts for that. So we do outside contracts too. So people. I was want just going to gonna ask about that. Yes, they do. Because so anywhere around the world, if somebody, people are always looking to get T-shirts made or something. I'm like that. I'm not sure around the world, but I think within our local community, <laughs> they could do but it. If somebody wanted to put it in order and wanted to call you, if there's a company in New Jersey that says, "Hey, we need a bunch of T-shirts, and I'm taking bids on things, and I would rather." Give right. the money to you. Mm -hmm. I, like I imagine that you and could I would work say it thank out. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so you get your cupcakes from them. You get your t-shirts from them. You're going to get your car detailed by them. We also have building maintenance, which we send uh, our interns. We we have 11 vans we transport kids to work in. We have fully, we have trailers for each of those programs that requires one. But our building maintenance, um, we service uh, 23 elementary schools. We have crews that go out every morning. And they'll go to an elementary school, they'll show up at the, at the facility, they'll go up to the plant manager and say, what do you need done today? And whatever it is, we do that service for them. And it's become a very valuable service for our elementary schools, especially here in the West Valley, because the schools out here are very large, but built many years ago. And the support, I'm not sure all of the support they have, they have a plant manager, and sometimes they may have a full-time or part-time evening person. And so we supplement that because they can't get everything just by, based on the size of the facility. And so we do that. We also have a landscaping program that's real landscaping, and they're ended up, the majority of the work that they're done is doing at people's houses. Right. So we're not going out and outbidding people. We're going them and giving them a price. We make very little profit on that, but we're, it's more of a training. But we just, we do all kinds of things from drought tolerant gardens mm -hmm. to landscaping to putting in a variety of pavers and things. But we ask them and they tell us what they want. We tell them how much it is to cost it. We're not raising the prices for those items. And then right. we get them and we do the work. And so they have so much work that they're turning down work mm, because they can't keep up yeah. with it. From there we go to a farming program. You want to talk about Julia's the program? farming independence program. And in that program, that class goes off three days a week. They go to different locations. They go to the Muse School, which is a vegan self-sustaining school in Malibu. And they do the transplanting for them. And they work with the little kids that are there. They all work kind of team up. They also go to Ride On and to ELSA, which are therapeutic riding organizations. And there they groom the horses. They walk them. They do a lot of mucking. The kids always talk about they have a lot of shoveling to do. Ranch, <laughs> ranch, ranch maintenance. Yeah. Right. But they like that too. And then they also have several garden plots on campus. And from that, they sell their vegetables. They share the vegetables with the culinary arts program. They're really pushing to become like a farm to table kind right. of setup. And then they make um, sugar and bath salt scrubs from the herbs and things that they do, essential oils and things like that as well. 
So, and there's You guys been... are impressive. <laughs> well, Can we just say? We're walking around the facility as we describe these things. <laughs> right? And you can go to Carol's class next. And then, um, yeah, we have a great textiles program. And in there, there's so many different machines. I have looked at them and I'm like, what are they? But they are all kinds of um, looms and sewing machines and sergers. She now has a heat press in there as well. And all of the students learn how to, you know, work on the looms and weave. And so they make ponchos and scarves, hats. They've started making these big origami purses now that are incredible. They make their own buttons. They do so many things. They've been working on bags where they're incorporating the student artwork into the design when they put them on the bags with the heat press now. So, And then they have four major sales a year. <laughs> and say. they make a lot of money for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Is the public invited to this sale where they can you know, buy they, stuff as it well? It hasn't been open yet. And the thing is, give you an example, the last sale they had in two hours, they made $900. Right. Yeah. I can and the imagine. time before, they made But you guys are hogging it and not yes, letting us come and purchase. <laughs> Just to look over the things as well, Wayne. And, and, I, and I think the reason for that is because we're a work training for program, we can't do the volume that we, yeah. we would like to sell some things on online, mm -hmm. but we realize we have three hours every day because all of our work programs are three hours long. You can only do so much in three hours, then they go off and have other classes and so forth. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it is a work training thing, but we do have product that comes out, and those products are excellent products. And when people see them, we also have staff from the Weavers Guild of America that come in and volunteer in there, and they're telling us, you know, things that we sell for twelve and fifteen dollars should be sold for seventy-five to a hundred dollars sure. because of the quality of materials that we're using. So that's been a very successful yeah. program in retail. Retail is a program. Um, it used to be open to most of the school, but now we leave it open to our junior population, which is like our 20 to 21 year old. Okay. They go off campus and work. Right now there's two two hour programs. Next year it'll be a three hour program. And they go to different stores like Joann's and they go to Walgreens and they go to Macy's. And they go with staff with their job coaches. We call them job coaches and they work at the stores. So they do stocking. They know all the vocabulary. I do not. The fronting, the facing, <laughs> there's something right, else. Right. I don't know. And <laughs> and they do that. They do a little bit of interaction with customers, but typically they learn to like help the customer find someone if they need assistance or something like that. And we decided to make it a junior program because our senior pro our seniors all work off campus. So it's a, we found that they need a little extra time, especially for our most independent seniors to be really ready to have that junior year experience before they moved on to their senior year. Okay, I got all these questions for you. So <laughs> when when somebody comes to you, mm -hmm. um, what is their day like in the beginning? It sounds like they spend a bit of time in that lab every day. Well, typically when someone comes in, um, I do a lot of tours every year. You're coming yeah. on Monday for a tour, yes. and that's in essence what we do um, probably four days a week. We have people coming in. We have a lot of parents that come in. We have We represent the San Fernando Valley, so virtually every high school in the San Fernando Valley, east, northwest, and northeast, sends their students to us at age 18. Okay. Some stay longer at the high schools and come to us a little bit later. It doesn't have to be at age 18. They can come anywhere between 18 and 22, but the earlier they come, the better. So they come from all of these high schools. And are they only coming if they didn't graduate? Right. Can somebody get a diploma and then come? No, no. no they're done. Okay. So all of, these, uh, all of these students are on the alternate curriculum. So Got that's it. a good thing. So what happens, they set up an appointment, they come around, we give them a tour, we take them to all these work programs that you're seeing, and they run throughout the day. So they go from first period to sixth period day. We have a typical sixth period day. So they don't see all the kids in action, but they go and I, when we take them around, we tell them what takes place in every one of the work programs. Okay. I think she's talking about the student day. Yes, but the student day. <laughs> also with the student day. Um, but this is the start because once they come in there and we take them in, then we program them. Mm -hmm. And it's not this, and we give them a choice. Give us your top five choices as far as your work program. Mm -hmm. But then we program them into um, their work program and the three other classes, and they're the independent living classes, the social skills classes, and the career classes. And Danielle can talk about that a little bit because mm -hmm. she wrote the curriculum. Her and a team put together the mm -hmm. first curriculum for all the in the in the district for career and transition centers. But then when they do that, they're 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 plugged in. They may end up getting that Pays Lab more towards when they graduate because we're trying to take all the oldest kids and make sure they all have it, and we move okay. down the list. I guess what I'm saying, because if somebody, if I'm bringing a student there and. If they're going to take, the, for right. instance, the the culinary, right. part, is that something they take one semester? They take it for a year. They yeah. take it for a year. Yeah, they'll take. And they'll, they have input on whether they get to take that. They well, get to pick their, their top three, and then the you top kind of five. Evaluate and we try five. to give them, we try to pl plug them in towards one of those top five choices. But if a young man or young woman comes in mid year, 
some of those classes may be oh, full, so okay. we put them in what's available at that okay. point. So th they get that experience, they're in it for a year, so over a three year period they get three work experiences. But again, in all of the work programs, they're still focusing on the soft skills. And those right. mm -hmm. basic soft skills are being addressed in every one of those work programs. I'm not preparing them, or we're not preparing them to go in a particular field, we're teaching them work. Right. And I remind them, and Which we often tell them, my first job, Honestly, I was age 12. I used to clean toilets every morning, scrub the floors, paint the walls, and make sure everything was clean. Danielle's was Magic Mountain. Magic Mountain. <laughs> there you um, go. It's we were not doing favorite. that for a career. We were being taught the principles of work and, and trying to earn a living and trying, not a living, excuse me, we're trying to earn some money. <laughs> right. And yeah. also to get a work experience. And that's what we're trying to do because all of our interns, we're preparing them for entry-level jobs. Right. And so we realize that an employer is going to, want them to do certain things, but are they, do they have the, what we call the soft skills, like I've mentioned, to be able to be a good employee, but we know the employer is going to teach them what they want them to okay. do. Okay. And then you mentioned, Danielle, that mm -hmm. in their junior years, if they're in the retail, they're, they're going to places like Macy's and mm -hmm. Walgreens and those kinds of, and then in their senior year, they're actually going to jobs. There are different levels to the senior, pro so we at, at the end of their junior year, we sit down and we look at the students, the teachers who teach the programs, and then Wayne and I will go in there and we'll get recommendations. And we look at the amount of support they still need in order to be independent. And so if they're a student that still requires a lot of support, they need that staff to be with them the whole day. They can work, but they still need those prompts and they still, what might not be that safe on the MTA, then they go into our supported senior program. Got it. And they go off campus and they go typically two to four hours a day, but they still have a job coach that stays with them. They travel in groups of two to four and they work at those same sort of sites. And they go, I think they also go to Hope of the Valley, places like that, like thrift stores and things. We're constantly expanding. Our job developer goes out and gets different locations for us. And, and are those internships or are they getting a pay? Well, they get a what we call a stipend okay. through workability. All right. As long as those funds are available, we're able to kind of give it to them, but it's more of a they initially are a volunteer experience so that they do okay. Generalization is very hard for our population, so as much as we, if we're on campus and working and we're working with the real tools and we're still doing all these real jobs, it's not the same as being out in public. So it's that really great opportunity to start taking those skills and learning to generalize them beyond our setting. And then I think the question that most everybody is going to have is, so then they graduate, mm -hmm. and is there some sort of a, a thing that you have that helps them to bridge from getting from graduation to get to the job? Or is that when they go to Joanne Lara? Well, it's <laughs> most, most of our interns are clients of regional centers. Yes. And see. so what we're trying to do is um, within that senior year, Several of our interns get hired because they've gone to these places of business mm -hmm. and they see that they're good workers and they're being offered an opportunity. So you to do work. have that happen we do. where we do. people will say, We want to keep you and we're going to pay. Yeah. But being part of the school district, I can't guarantee right, that they're yeah. going to leave of a job, not. but we are pushing them towards that. That said, um, you know, most of our clients or most of our, our interns do get Social Security. Yes. And that becomes a challenge for parents. There are parents that are fearful of, lo of losing that check once yes, they go out to work, mm -hmm. even though they can go out to work and still maintain that. Security. But I always say if they're making more money than they can bring in with that Social Security check, that's a good thing for, the, for our interns. And also remembering, realistically, that check belongs to, should follow the intern wherever they go but also realizing the state of the economy and there's a lot of pam families that rely on that mm -hmm. social security check, so it's a real challenge. So those are some of the obstacles that we are, are facing. Another obstacle that we face today is the, social, is the minimum wage. Now, we talk about that being a very positive type thing, and it is for some, but when it comes to our interns, it becomes somewhat of a negative. And the negative is if you're an employer we used to be able to pay three people $5 an hour to get a work experience, and that's what it was designed for. Get that initial work experience, get it on a resume, and then go out from there. You know, now people are working in those entry-level jobs, and some are becoming permanent jobs. And so if, if there's a choice between Danielle and one of our interns, and she has a family, then I say she should be offered that job. So now the pay has gone up enough so that there are employers that can't afford to pay two people at that rate where right. they used to do or pay you know three people out of that. It's a challenge. It's a hard challenge, but it's realistic to us. And, and, and I get it. It's a positive thing, but 
for our interns, it poses a challenge. Now, we are getting kids hired. I was going to say, on the flip side of that, yeah. we have the more that we do go out into the community and right. the more that our interns, because in addition to the supported program, we have our independent interns. And those are our interns that we know can take the MTA safely because they have to to get to right. work. They right. take it to get there and back. And we know that eventually we initially send a job coach out, but that they'll be able to work on their own. It, uh, these companies and corporations are so interested in our population right. now because you know, you don't have a lot of experience with a person with a disability. So you have this very, you know, contrived vision in your head of what it is. What does that look like? What does it look like someone with autism or Down syndrome? Or we have hard of hearing students, deaf students who come in and they're, oh, oh what is that? But then they meet them and they're like, oh my goodness, you know, yeah. they're these great workers. They really want to be here. They're trying really hard. And we have had a lot get direct hire from our, you know, being in the program. I have students who, we have one that's getting a second job now that graduated who is deaf because he wants to move out now. So. Right. <laughs> well, that's yeah. a good sign, isn't it? Is. it? Yes. It so. is. And one uh, of your neighbors, Marriott Hotel, which is over here, yeah. the Marriott Corporation has been very supportive. Yes, because very Several of our, yes. of our interns being hired by them. And uh, Walgreens is another one. And I know there was a big article, or actually it was on the, on the news a couple years ago, the vice president of Walgreens opened up a distribution center in I think either North or South Carolina where I think 40% of the employees yeah. were people with disabilities. And that's exciting, that's but he came exciting. from that, he had a daughter, and that was really a motivation to do that. So we all become advocates for our kids. Yes. And as more people see that our, our young men and women can be uh, contributing members of society, it opens the door for them. Um, but it's still a tough go. It is. Um, but as they say, Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs, mm -hmm. who has a foundation on employment and talks about people, said recently at Congress that there's five and a half million jobs out there that people don't want to do. Right. And so some of those jobs are things that I believe that our interns could do if they're yeah. willing to go out there and do that. Well, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's here in Los Angeles. We need to tell people, if they're interested in finding out more about it, where do they go? Who do they call? What website? <laughs> Where do you want to send them? <laughs> That's is, good. Is there a Facebook page? There is a, there Facebook, is a Facebook page. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, I would say contact Miller Career and Transition Center, uh, area code 818-885-1646. Okay, and we're going to have to say that again slower because a lot of people listen to this in podcast in their car, oh. okay. so they may not be able to see it. Tell area them. code 818-885-1646. Okay. And if you go into Google and put Miller Career and Transition Center, it'll take you right to our website. That's the easiest way to go. Now... Who pays for the student being there? Is that the LAUSD school district? It's, we're part of the school district, yes. and we're very thankful we're part of the school district because they've been very supportive in the process that we are doing. And now we've been duplicated five other times in the district, and so we're spread throughout the city now. It's not Miller out there, but it's Perez Career and Transition Center, Whitney Career and Transition Center, Banneker Career and Transition Center, Willenberg Career and Transition Center, Leachman is moving to Career and Transition Center, and we're looking at opening one more on the west side. Okay. Also. And because I'm sure that there are going to be some people in Kansas who go, well, I, you know, I don't live close enough to drive my kid there. <laughs> right. um, so there's going to be two different types of questions about how do I get this? Is the curriculum available? Can I, is there a place where I can go to find out how to, how to recreate this where I live? Have you written the book yet, Wayne? <laughs> I'm not a writer. Danielle is much better at doing that. Danielle, have you written the book yet? Not yet. The how to, the how to manual. Well, something you guys need to think about because obviously this needs to be in more places and people are going to, I'm sure people are already asking you, how, what's, you know, how do you put this together? It might be something to consider. We get a lot of school districts that do come and visit us. So okay. it gives yeah. them an opportunity. You know, we're not the end all to everything. Right. I mean, I would. I'd Wayne, love you're to not sit. perfect. <laughs> you haven't figured the whole thing out yet. My wife will remind you of that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we are doing good things, and I think we've created a model. And I think that the challenge that we all face, and we all talk about that, is she talks about change. We're changing constantly because we're trying to adapt what our interns need to have before they leave us. Yeah. So each year there's a reevaluation, like switching all the classes next year where the teachers and the students are going in, or the interns, for a purpose that we can have selected materials and selected mm -hmm. classes for the independent living. Instead of the materials going all over the school, it would be specific to a couple classrooms. The same with our career classes and our social skills classes. So those are challenges we face, but we're constantly adapting. So. I think really it starts with a heart and willingness to reach out to the, and, and ask, the, ask themselves the same question we asked ourselves. 
what are we, if they're not going to get a diploma, what are we preparing them for? Yeah. And so even if they're getting a diploma, what are we preparing them for? And you know, the ultimate goal for anybody who goes to school is to go to work. Hopefully that's the goal. You go to college to get a right. job. But even at college level, they're not teaching you the concept of work. They're teaching you your major and so forth. And even on the regular high school campuses, you know, there used to be um, all kinds of programs, uh, vocational programs at the yeah. high school. They're gone, essentially. They are so gone. Some are beginning to come back, which is a good thing. Her former high school. At Monroe. Monroe High School <laughs> has a, a, is a law and justice classroom where they have a courthouse set up there. And I heard they're opening up a new wood shop there. So things are being added. Um, and we only, our population only represents a small population, the dis disabled population in LA Unified. Uh, ours are more than moderate to severe, even though most of us are towards the moderate mm -hmm. level of that. Mm -hmm. But you have 65,000 students with specific learning disabilities, and there's, and you have those students with autism that are going to get diplomas. So there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be addressed in the future. Yeah. But I believe we, I believe that we've taken some real positive steps towards addressing at least the population that we work with. Well, amazing. And then I, I'm still going back to, I said there were going to be two types of questions. One, how do I bring it here? And then there are going to be other people saying, if I, you know, do I have to move to LA uh, to be, like, do you, can somebody send a student from someplace else? They have to have a residency. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because I get to do all the IEP work. Um, <laughs> you do have to be a resident of Los Angeles in order, because we are a public LAUSD school, so we have to take people that are within our boundaries. Okay, so you have so, to live within the LAUSD boundaries yes. in order to get this kind of a thing. And to come to Miller, you have to live within the San, San Fernando, Fernando Valley. Valley. Because there are other mm. career and transition centers. So. Exclusive right. of Burbank, exclusive of Glendale, exclusive of Calabasas, because they're on their own school districts. So... We, they have to be an LAUSD resident. Yeah. All right. so. mm -hmm. That's a pretty specific thing. Uh, well, we thank you guys so much. Can't wait to come and see the tour because uh, Nancy Oswald Jackson and I are going to go and take the tour and uh, we're excited to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And we just appreciate you guys so much. And oh, and, and obviously if people want to order baked goods or they want to order t-shirts <laughs> right. or they want to get a, a, a plane or a boat or a car <laughs> detail, mm -hmm. um, for those of you who have planes, uh, same phone number that they call? It is. Tell it, it is. again. It slowly, is. Please. It's, it's area code 818-885-1646. And I want to close with one thing and just tell parents out there, one of the things that we learned is your students can do far more than you ever imagine when they're given the opportunity to do it. And I think that's one of the things that we've done is we're pushing them along, we're pushing them forward, and when we do that, we realize um, many of these kids, and we often hear from parents are doing things I never thought they could do. Yeah. And my answer to that is pretty simple because you probably didn't give them a chance to do it. And I understand that. I do understand yeah. it from a parental standpoint. I'm a parent and a grandparent. Danielle's a parent. But if they're going to be successful someday, we have to be able to push them to that point where they can be at least attempt to contribute and be a contributing member of society. I want all of my kids to be taxpayers. <laughs> they do. What a great goal. Yeah. What a great goal. Uh, we started, I said I wasn't going to cry, but you made me tear up there, Wayne. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. You, you brought it home She blames me for doing I that do. often. It makes people cry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way, yeah. because you were making dreams come true. You are giving people um, self-esteem, because this is what it comes down to, is yes. if we don't have a job, and, and, I, and I mean in all sense of that, you know, a paying job, but also a, a place a where we fit in, mm -hmm. a purpose, purpose right. mm -hmm. you know, then we don't have a place. Joanne Laura always says that I want a seat at the table, is right. what uh, so many of these individuals, um, and you're giving them that opportunity. It's got a lot of um, problems to, right. that you have to overcome, that you're, you're figuring out the puzzle pieces, but I think as parents, we have to constantly evaluate and say, Am I getting in the way of the progress that I said that I wanted? Whether it be employment or volunteering or just doing something to where they're, they feel the sense, the individual mm. intern feels a sense that I am contributing and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not on the receiving end. I don't want them to be on the receiving end. I want them to be somehow on the contributing end, whatever right. that looks like. To feel that they are of value. They are. That's what right. we all want.